important mock question. Take uh, maybe another two, three hours if we answer all the questions. Maybe Dr. Ravindra sir can pick up the important questions and then uh, ask the panelists. Yeah, I've, uh, uh, thanks, Anthil. It's a wonderful program. Thanks to both the speakers. And uh, I would appreciate if all the panelists can contribute quickly so that we can cover many of the questions. And uh, the to begin with, uh, uh, what is the autoclave that we should be buying as a practitioner uh, doing cataract surgeries, vitrectomies, and other ophthalmic surgeries? Uh, can uh, Dr. Sanjay tell us which is the autoclave that one should be buying it? Number one, if somebody has do not have a B class autoclave, they have an S class autoclave or they have vertical autoclave which does not have vacuum pumps. What is your recommendation? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, sir, I would like to keep the terminology simple. So, when we say S class, N class, B class, there's a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. So, what I generally use is vacuum and gravity. So, just two types of autoclaves, vacuum and gravity. The sizes may be highly varied from a small tabletop one to a room size autoclave, but you can have both varieties in those sizes. Okay. So, for a cataract surgery where you use hollow instruments, I would always suggest go for a vacuum autoclave, pre vacuum autoclave, what you call as a class B. So, that would be the preferable one anytime. And if the hospital does not have a class B or a pre vacuum autoclave, in that case, they will have to use a gravity displacement one, where I would suggest that they should keep the instrument drums at the top, like Dr. Raju said, because the air pockets will be there in a gravity displacement, but usually they will settle down at the bottom. Now, some vertical autoclave models, they have an air removal system. It's not an active one, it's a passive one, but many brands in the market, they don't have it. So to be on the safe side, keep the instruments on the top and make sure that it is not overloaded. So the drum should not be overloaded with too many sets. So there should be free circulation of steam. That is very, very important. And the second thing when you're using a gravity displacement machine is we cannot use paper for wrapping because there is no drying mechanism. So you will have to go for linen wraps. And if they remain wet, then we call it as unsterile. So the drying period is very long. So the number of loads that you can get in a gravity displacement sterilizer per day is definitely less than going for a pre-vacuum one. So I, I would encourage all people to go for a class B. And uh, second, what I advise usually many hospitals is you do not mix linen and instruments. See, in a uh, optum surgery, what I found is whatever goes into the eye, instruments, fluids, they are the first uh, suspects suspect, suspect of infection. So here we are talking about instruments and linen. So separate the two. For instruments, we should always go for a class B. Linen class B is ideal, but if it is not there, gravity also will do. But make sure it is dry at the end of the autoclaving cycle. Can you tell us, uh, can uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Shakti tell us uh, if they have a vertical autoclave or, uh, you know, not a vacuum autoclave, but the standard autoclave, which is horizontal without a vacuum pump, what is the best way to prevent, minimize a wet pack? Sir. Actually, uh, there is a drying option without the vacuum pump. As uh, Sanjay sir told, there's a partial model. There's one model in vertical called as a triple wall model, where the uh, where you have a steam storing option with vacuum venturi facility. So um, this is used uh, in certain practices where actually uh, the the, the generated uh, steam from the jacket through that the vacuum is generated through a venturi ejector so where uh, a partial vacuum happens so probably the issue is once after sterilization it would take at least 30 to 35 minutes only for drying and uh, can we shakti can we uh, convert a standard autoclave which is there in most of the theaters into a venturi uh, drying mm -hmm. machine is it possible to add on something to uh, you know do this uh, uh, drying process the, the, the problem is uh, somebody do not want to buy a b autoclave yeah, yes sir but the we can we can convert but to some extent, the problem is you should have a high uh, steam generating force. Once you generate more steam, that uh, 
ejector can uh, convert that to vacuum the problem is that question, requires huge question, power there was a question here to enhance the heating uh, of the instruments can we trap the steam inside and keep it for a longer time uh, yeah. or should the steam be let I mean, out like you have a holding, a holding time of 15 minutes 20 minutes whatever it is should we let the steam out immediately or can you keep the steam overnight so that next day morning you know the the uh, sets are opened and used and now because uh, over exposure of steam will uh, it will impact the instruments what you uh, load inside so 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 it's always recommend recomm recommendable to uh, exhaust the steam once the uh, yes. required very, temperature very good, and time very, is attained very good point that also minimizes the pressure itself takes out most of the steam and yes. as dr raju nicely pointed out in his lecture the condensation of steam on the instruments and back will be totally avoided uh i i have one point sir i think there is a repeated question coming on like suppose you are using a packed instrument packed set wrap set and how long uh, is it sterile that is the question that is commonly asked so what's your take on that sir and then i'll come back and again i'll make one more point fine uh, uh, it again depends upon the type of autoclave you have type of the environment so suppose we are using a class b autoclave we have double wrap the instruments uh, feco set what we use is all wrapped and put in the thing and what what is the shelf life of that set so theoretically shelf life is all the time like you, know, you have Correct. you said 1 million once one bacteria is alive once spore is alive that will take a long time to multiply and if you the storage is good like if it's a dry area if there's no fluid splashes there humidity is not there and you stored it nicely it 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 works for a long time but it, it all depends upon the type of autoclave you have what is the validation that you have done for the autoclave and then third is how you have stored it if you have a, there are separate compartments which are dry and which are clean uh, where you can store them where the ah is there inside the compartments if you store them it's all the time so like in our own hospital we have uh, uh, when you when you put a sticker on it don't put when it was autoclaved put the expiry date like if you have autoclave today in our hospital expiry date is today is sunday next saturday so we'll put the date of expiry it expires on saturday next saturday so that's what you should put at a sticker after that it is not going to be used so that's a good question uh, raju uh, i'll just make a point sir what i would like to point out here is, uh, here is if you are for the visco that we are using is all steam sterilized is all steam sterilized and that expiry period is one year so what i meant to say was the steam sterilization is a very effective sterilization provided you have validated it correctly so it 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 is until the pack is open as if i remember dr sanjay sir telling me that until it is open or till you have validated and you have shown that that it is uh clear for such long periods may i add something sir here yes the basic concept is once you have sterilized the pack as long as no air or liquids go in and out it is going to remain sterile so it all depends on the wrapping how you are handling it during transport and storage Correct. and of course the method that we have used so that's why post autoclave uh, handling sterilization factors are important because of this so we cannot maintain this 100% in every setup so that's why there is a certain cut off now this cut off may be either time related or event related so if you open a sterile pack after that image once it is exposed to air we call it as unsterile you have to re-sterilize before you use on the next patient and you can have event this is called event related or you can have a time related also so 3 days 7 days depending on the wrapping and storage methods so most hospitals they will use a hybrid of this so you give an expiry life of certain days 3 days 7 days depending on your conditions in your setup and before that if somebody opens it you re autoclave before you use it again if you don't use it in the expiry period you re clean re autoclave after the expiry period is over so this is the combination we use in most of the hospitals so sanjay the, the point that comes here is the use of bins and even uh, during the lectures bins were used but uh, long decades ago we told everybody that bins should be abandoned from after mix theater it should be packs and uh, this is one uh, note that everybody should carry out work towards abolishing bins because yes. the moment 
the bin has got holes all around and it's heat heat it's heated and warm and moist when you take it out and put it when the moisture condenses there is a negative pressure inside the bin and the atmospheric air is pulled into the bins so everything is unsterile atmospheric air is unsterile so there is a strong appeal to everybody to avoid i think shakti you should en en enhance this appeal that bins should not be used in ophthalmology convert them into packs yes can uh, dr samina tell us how to prepare a packs quickly how do you make instruments into packs so we use paper plastic uh, filaments uh, pouches and we double wrap it so that was a discussion right now whether should we do a single pouch or a double pouch for uh, packing these instruments we do it with a double pouch because we feel that the storage uh, contamination during storage also doesn't happen what, and what exactly parallel... which which pouch do you use for the uh... these are there are uh, two different varieties uh, what we have one is a paper plastic one and another is a uh, standard tyvek pouches so uh, we use our expiry date is one week within a week's time we like exactly like what you said we use the uh, instruments and uh, but if we want a, certain instruments like the micro capsular rex is forceps and all we pack it in a tyvek pouch so that expiry date is for a month we keep it for a month because that's a superior quality packing your expiry is definitely directly proportional to your packing material your the uh, your sealing machine how good is your sealing machine and your storage conditions so with these three things in place uh, uh, we always see that uh, we are very strict about within a week if we are doing a regular paper Dr. plastic Dr. Samina, can you tell us uh, more about the tyvek pouch everybody understands there are many qualities of tyvek pouches please do go ahead with everything that looks greenish and uh, transparent are not tyvek pouches there are, <laughs> there are dozens of varieties of them dozens of material that's used let us not go into the details i'm more curious about linen versus paper that you're talking about can somebody using linen if the linen is of good quality and no visible holes in that is that good enough for double wrapping or should we migrate to the paper so linen is good enough especially if there is some quality control of the linen that there are the pores and everything is checked regularly it's not that there is you keep on using linen till it's completely torn and then you throw away so there has to be a quality control for linen if you are using linen pouches uh, linen packing and that's perfectly fine it's not necessary that everybody there is another alternative you, you can have the inner with the, the paper the outer can be linen and the, all the linen should be color coded so like if you have different kinds of instruments like vitrectomy or a cataract or something else have the linen of color coding so if you want to save on paper you can use first coat as paper because paper is highly sensitive for moisture as against the uh, linen uh so outer can be linen if you want to do it but if somebody is using good quality linen on both the sides there is no need to change it that's my personal opinion to save the uh, amount of wastage that we have with the papers can paper be reused dr samina it looks so no. good at the end of the cycle not at all <laughs> not at all fine good, not at good all. answers so actually uh, we are, sorry sir uh, what happens is when we were interacting uh, with the ophthalmologist many of them were hell bent on the bins because they in fact were uh, asking pressurizing shakti to uh, make the autoclave uh, customize it for their bins though we were trying to propagate because people feel the things put inside the bin is more it gives you that uh, false sense of security so maybe i think we should advocate uh, this uh, because it's uh, that mindset of bins we have to come out of that mindset of what shakti shakti do you have do you have a carrier inside to specific carrier to keep the uh, the packs or is it dumped one another see aeration is very important every pack should be uh, kept isolated from the next pack so how do you ensure in your autoclave it happens sir actually it depends on the sizes uh, for if it's a bench top there's already trays provided and uh, generally the theory is uh, uh, 75% that should be a 25 percentage of uh, space in how order you, for this team see like you have yeah. an autoclave yes. and uh, you are giving it to us and uh, who yeah. is going to validate you validate or somebody else comes and validate third party we generally validate because we have a uh, as i already showed because all equipments have been bodic tested and uh, helix tested at a facility 
I and only say, then we uh, supply the equipment uh, so as a to the end user. You will so have a, you have a, always. As a manufacturer, yes. you will have a vested interest to clear all the products. Yes, so is yes, it sir. necessary for a third, third party, party to come and validate? I think, Nirmal sir, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, we we actually suggest that because before dispatch, it is our duty to validate all protocols. So once and uh, if a third party validates, probably it, it ensures the end user as well. And there is uh, after supplying while supplying, there is one called IQ OQP documentation. So these are being followed in pharma standards. Probably on request of them, uh, we ourselves we call the third party people to come and uh, validate our own machine. So it depends on the end user. Required. About the vacuum cycles we turn on installation site. About the vacuum cycles, they are all identical for all the autoclaves that you manufacture, or individual autoclaves are set for the number of vacuum cycles, uh, you know, to uh, give the excellent results. Yeah, actually, uh, we have been our uh, programmers have been planned in such a way that you can vary and modify each and every pulsing limit and also you can also vary the uh, 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 pressure if you want vacuum to go to minus eight you can vary and you want more vacuum for uh, hollow you can take it up to minus uh, 15 psi because everything is editable as per user requirement see over a period of time there is a wear off of autoclave the function the heating the vacuum there is a there is a uh, de de uh, decay so yeah. uh, how often do you think we have to revalidate the autoclaves after it's purchased because validate uh, autoclaves are uh, better to be validated from the manufacturer for at least uh, uh, four to five months but uh, uh, because as i already told you can validate it yourself with a body pack at least a week or with the helix test uh, daily and with the uh, biological indicators once in a month and uh, at the validation in sense the heart um, heart gauges those pressure gauges and those temperature gauges had to be calibrated at least once a year once so yeah, so those gauges had to be calibrated from third party from the NABL lab, so that uh, this happens yearly, okay. once in a year. Dr. Nirmal, you you are very strong in quality, and uh, you know you have uh, your own views on autoclaving, and uh, you're also uh, you know uh, have uh, uh, told us the guidelines for NABH. What NABH guidelines are there for an autoclave? I'll tell you a scenario where. There is a surgeon, surgeon who is uh, very methodical and he uh, does phaco surgery and puts all his phaco probe, phaco tubing, sleeve, everything into the autoclave. That is the S class autoclave, uh, the tabletop flash autoclave, and redoes this. He does brings it back and do surgery. It's very meticulous. Would he approve it from NABA standards or would he say that the uh, flash autoclaves are not as good as B class autoclave? Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Santil for giving me this opportunity and Dr. Avindra for this question. Uh, first of all, it's a hypothetical scenario and uh, the hypothetical scenario are better answered with the uh, standards in place. First, I would see the infrastructure, the infrastructure where the uh, autoclave uh, is placed and the process as such goes on as per the standard operating procedures. The second point you're asking is, uh, say S-class, uh, I think so many things have been spoken about this S-class and B-class and about the hollowed, about the uh, uh, hollowed equipment being uh, the fear of unsterilized uh, hollowed equipment in S-class. It is valid in uh, conditions where you are using a lot of hollow tubing, particularly if you are using a phaco emulsification uh, reusable tubings. And if it is a S-class, there is indeed a, uh, a po point where you have to consider class B. So mixing these two types of uh, processes and uh, infrastructure, uh, it's quite difficult to answer. So you may escape with few incidences, but you can't es escape all the time. So I would rather uh, focus on three things first. One is the infrastructure, where you need to focus on equipment, 
and uh, the methodology of the uh, <coughs> sterilization. I think Dr. Raju has given enough thing about using a good autoclave. And in ophthalmology, we are using a lot of hollow uh, tubings. And we are going to reuse those equipment better to stick to class B. The second point is about infrastructure is not available, but the process is 100% good. And it's very difficult to have 100% process maturity in our setup where there are a lot of human interfaces. So you can't predict human errors at one point of time. That is one of the reasons why standards and quality control agencies focus on having these triad in place. Uh, <clears throat> the infrastructure, the process, and the outcomes. So you can't have deficient infrastructure, have good 100% process all the time. There is bound to be human errors sometimes. And these are the human errors that has to be focused. And standards do take care of this human errors for better outcomes. Sir, I would like to make a point here. So it's very important to understand there's nothing called as flash autoclave. It is a flash cycle. You're using a flash cycle. What you're modifying is if you have an autoclave, which can go up till 132 degrees, then your holding time can be reduced to say four minutes because you will have enough sterilization happening in that time. And the flash cycle is an unwrapped cycle. cycle. Okay, And you are reducing your drying time. There is no dry temperature actually. Uh, the rest of the things are all same. It's very important to understand there's nothing called as a flash autoclave. It's a flash cycle. It's a flash cycle. Uh, and Raju, Raju, American no, academic second thing, Raju, it's not, not only the flash cycle. It also damages the FACO hand pieces if you're going to use that for your FACO hand pieces. So sir, it's not good. Second the, Sir, I, I would beg to be before here. We are using the same, we are using the same sterilization holding time that we used in a full cycle autoclave, in a flash cycle also. So yes, only thing is the cooling, if you're not allowing to happen, the, you, I agree with you that uh, the uh, FACO handpiece may get, uh, uh, have, may get because of the effect on the crystals part of it. The MS of Indusar, if I'm correct, you should allow the handpiece to cool down before use. That's what has been uh, said. But if, with respect to the instruments part of it, it doesn't matter. So and the, uh, the immediate use sterilization was studied in the American Journal. They have published this uh, article wherein they compared unwrapped cycle kept within the auto OT versus the regular CSST. And the, uh, uh, the end of rates were nothing different. I have the paper with me here. So the immediate use sterilization with the equipment kept inside the OT and used immediately is as good. That has been proven. So, so there, that again, uh, Dr. Sanjay, sir, you can uh, do your comments, please. The timings of a flash cycle are actually shorter compared to a standard cycle. And the item is unwrapped. It is wet and hot at the end of the cycle. So Correct. when you open the machine, it has to be delivered directly onto your sterile trolley. So you have to keep the machine in the OT. And the reason why flash is not advocated as a stand routine method of sterilization is because of the short timing, high temperature, short time cycle. There is a risk of inadequate sterilization, especially in hollow items. So that's why you look at any guideline, flash is only to be used as an emergency for a dropped instruments, not as a routine method of sterilization. So it's a cycle, it's not a machine. So we go for a bleak glass with a standard cycle. In an emergency, of course, the same machine will also have a flash cycle. Uh, actually, I would, uh, I would agree uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay because uh, most of the desktop autoclaves are not B class autoclaves. They will not have the uh, vacuum facilities. They may have a drying facility, but they don't have a vacuum facility. So the moment you don't have a vacuum facility, the tubings cannot be sterilized there. So okay. I, I personally think it's not right to autoclave ophthalmic instruments unless you have only the surgical instruments individual surgical instruments you put it on a tray and put it in an s-class autoclave most of the tabletops are s-class autoclave we have uh, the autoclaves which tabletop autoclaves which can be used at a b-class mode yeah uh, but then they take a lot of time for autoclaving it takes one hour cycle so the best is to have four to five uh FACO probes and the sterilize all of them use one after another one and put all the four of them for re-autoclaving if you have a long list of cases. 
I think uh, Dr. Senthil, kindly pardon me, I'll have to leave this yes. and I'll ask uh, Dr. Raju to moderate. I have another program which they are calling me again and again. Yes, sir. And, thank uh, thanks for the thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your valuable input. Actually, yeah, on this uh, flash autoclave, we did a survey. I think at least 90% of the eye hospitals still have the flash bench bench uh, top autoclave. That's, so that's what I'm trying to make the concept. Really. Those were the days when ECC was practiced, not when FACO. Okay, so when ECC was practiced, ICC and ECC, there were flash autoclaves. There used to be hundreds of surgeries being done, so only heat sterilization. At that time, it was purchased and uh, basically habits die hard with, with our people. So they continued to uh, keep fighting for that, citing the old uh, <coughs> research publications. Yeah. When you are going to use hollow equipment, and particularly FACO is going to be the only hollow equipment in most of our surgeries, and in vitrectomy procedures where there are long hollow tubes, you, you have to think about the science involved and try to switch over and, uh, and not to fight over the old habits. No, sir. What, what I meant to say was, no, no, you don't say, uh, I probably I didn't communicate myself correctly. What I meant to say was, it is not the flash autoclave, it is the flash cycle that you are using. So it is yeah. now... Even even in class B autoclave, you can have flash cycle okay. program set. So it's only the settings that differ. Okay. But what? generally, we don't advocate it for FACO emulsification. Okay. Correct. Okay, so because one, it spoils the equipment. Second, it doesn't sterilize the hollow equipments properly. And third, it over a period of time, it is, uh, as Dr. Sanjay said, because of the short cycle and risk of infection, we don't advocate the usage of that. No. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. What all, I of mean, us, all of us are telling the same thing in different words. No, actually, yeah, the understanding is that the flash of the clave means uh, the table bench top. No, no, no. no. That's table. not the thing. I a think table top autoclave can be a class B autoclave running a full cycle. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. the thing. Yes, actually, that means the many people, have, many people have a because it is table top, it doesn't mean flash. Okay. Sir, uh, regarding this uh, documentation and for NABH, uh, I request Dr. Nirmal to, uh, is it important to document each autoclave cycle, take a printout and uh, what is the standard uh, for NABH? And uh, are we, is it important to have these uh, digital autoclaves which have this uh, recording capacity and you get a printout uh, of each uh, autoclave process cycle? Uh, so what uh, about the NABH? Standards for that, sir. NABH standards are based on legal guidelines, the legal requirement of running a critical care unit in your facility and the necessary statutory requirements. See, when you are running a critical care facility like Operation Theater you are in your unit, you are licensed to run that. So when you are licensed to run a critical care facility, you are bound to have certain registers in your facility uh, because all licensing requirements are based on documentation. So these documentation indicates uh, certain things. When you are doing a procedure in your theater, the register has to be maintained, the, num the patient name, the surgery details, and of course the important parameters like uh, sterilization indicators. So, and also the consumables used, mainly the implants. So this is called as master logbook, and it is mandatory that all licensed critical care unit maintain this master logbook. One of the components of master logbook is sterilization indicator, and it is mandatory that all of us should uh, have this. It is not a requirement for NABH alone. It is a requirement for your licensing process. So when CEA, uh, say after five years, they come for re-registration. They will ask you about these kind of document, uh, the master logbooks and important statutory documentation. These are called external <coughs> quality assurance uh, programs. So uh, don't bring NABH into it. NABH standards mentioned that all government regulations are adhered to by the care organization. So that is where standard uh, implicitly puts it. Okay, so NABH standard says, please adhere to government regulations. Government regulation mandates that if you want a license, adhere to master logbook. And this master logbook, whenever the uh, government or the uh, CEO authority uh, asks for the document, you have to submit. 
it is important when there is a cluster infection in your organization or when there is a medical legal issue during medical legal issue the court is mandated to collect all this document so it is necessary you maintain this on a day to day basis because any legal uh, thing can happen suddenly and the first thing police or the investigate agency do is capture all your master logbooks and documentation so that is one of the reason why documentation has to be done then and there in a chronological order so don't bring uh, nabh into each and everything of the issue it is a government regulation and it requirement from the licensing point of view actually when we add uh, something yes sir yes sir, sir even the hospitals those are not going for nabh or anything like that even apart from all those things i would say monitoring sterilization is important because of some two three reasons first thing as dr rajwesh pointed out it's a probability it's a blind process you can never have a real time test to find out whether the instruments were sterilized as soon as you remove them from the autoclave there's no test in the world to do that that is the first issue so you have to monitor the process as much as you can and maintain documentation as sir said for your medical legal aspects also second thing is infections are unpredictable i have seen consultants operating for 30 years and then getting infections it can happen to anyone so if you suffer such an episode you need to go back and be able to trace whether everything was okay I, I, for that you need detailed documentation and as i mentioned previously anything that goes into the eye is the first suspect your iv fluids and your instruments particularly cleaning and sterilization so documenting these two things are be going to be very important for preventing outbreaks also and for analyzing the cause of the outbreak also so apart from any bh regulation everything this is the reason why mainly it should be done so can we take it as uh, having this uh, uh, fully automated autoclaves which also store the data and give you those print out is it uh, uh, better in terms of documentation yeah, yeah. it is just making your process easier see generally you are dependent on the uh, technician to write this data document and then uh store I mean make it part of your medical records when you have a print out you just take the print out and uh, stick on to your uh, uh, medical record or you update it into your emr so it just makes the process easier yeah yeah and also reduces the human error so when uh, people enter so many numbers on a regular basis there can be some errors so when you have this automated print out it makes the process with uh, <coughs> uh, not on people dependent it's on machine dependent yeah what i would suggest is if you have the budget go for the best documentation method you can get okay. sir uh, uh, yeah actually dr raju wanted to add something then we can uh, call uh, dr partho bakshi to give us input so sir yeah i just wanted to make a point here this is what i have quoting here is from the alcon laboratories this is what they have validated for their hand piece okay and this is what we are supposed to use it now if you look at the settings that they are given if you are using a rap cycle in a gravity displacement you have to do 132 do degrees for 18 minutes okay and this is given by alcon laboratories and we have to uh, do it ourselves but they have validated and given this and 121 degrees is not given by the manufacturer and you can ask them you can ask your equipment who are supplied your feco hand piece to give you the validity certificate of what they have done as a validity for the sterilization and use the same thing but this is what is there from the alcon for their hand piece so if you are using a unwrapped cycle at 132 degrees with a pre vacuum or a class b it is 4 minutes but if you are using a gravity displacement 132 degrees for 18 minutes so that's the difference so if you are using a class b at 134 higher temperature what some of us were telling may damage its is when the cooling if you don't allow it to cool and you use it this is what the company has been telling us that it, you have to do it at 132 degrees for that you need a pre vacuum machine sir yes you can't get 132 in a gravity properly yeah yeah correct correct right. and one of the standard objective is uh, follow the manufacturer guidelines so Correct. if you are using a alcon hand piece follow their hand uh, settings Correct. and we are using a amo or uh, upper probe use their standard guidelines 
at least alcon has given these timings and minimum exposure time in amo they have just uh, given it in a very loosely as what 120 degrees or 132 degrees that's all they are not mentioned the holding time what time what uh, wrapped or unwrapped nothing has been given so that is where the problem comes when hand pieces uh, get faulty they said that uh, we can't uh, have this amc or cnc in hold because your staff didn't um, follow the manufacturer guidelines so the, so better to ask them for a copy official copy of that yeah so during installation we have to get their uh, inputs in writing that this is the standard setting for sterilization correct to dr nirmal is dr parth uh, do you have any inputs uh, you can no, I, i wanted to ask uh, dr nirmal a question is the master logbook available uh, freely online or how do we uh, procure it there are printed master logbooks available for ophthalmology i think anand enterprises is uh, giving a manual uh, uh, register or most of the ems uh, have the standard formats now i use a netram uh, eli e- emr so we work with them to standardize these uh, uh, logbook parameters so that they have uh, same settings so all they need is uh, the patient details the consumables or the implant details and the sterilization details and of course the indicators whether class 5 or class 6 whatever you use and the validation forms there are a couple of questions from the register sir please go ahead please go sir what you are referring to as a master log book is the same as the ot register yes the ot register will have a <laughs> linkage to your autoclave there are some organization which have a separate logbook for only autoclaving and yes. sterilization indicators that is preferable sir because the documentation will be both for the autoclave for two reasons one the ot technician and the infection control team can have can maintain this and the quality team can have a control over it and also they see the trend if there is a infection or the risk of infection they can use this logbook to get a do a recall procedure yes. properly and inform the surgeon or the surgical team about there is a break in the infection process yes and a break, also, break in the sterilization process yeah so i also suggest uh, hospitals to have a separate logbook for each sterilizer that they have suppose you have two autoclaves have to tape the machines a and b so because you have to give batch numbers and maintain separate registers for each machine of sterilization that you have eto two autoclaves whatever so that way it is easier to trace depends on the size of the organization and the manpower involved so yeah so maybe we can go on a standardized uh, master logbook format so that all across the board everybody can adopt it and we can have a standardized uh, method for everybody so no, it's very difficult dr patho because the size of our ophthalmic uh, institution you have medical colleges you have huge ngo institution doing 1 lakh cases per month okay on the other hand we have a spectrum where there are hardly 3 to 5 cases per week so it's very very difficult to you know satisfy across the spectrum so all that is we need the parameters in a proper register format so that it is not it is you documented properly and in term in uh, times of requirement like a medical legal mishap you the documentation is uh, used for to to prevent any medical legal complications and also save the surgeon and the hospital shakti maybe you can add in about uh, what are the documentation uh, possibilities available in uh, the sort of clay the digital uh, thing and how do we get the print out and other things so actually uh, first with the, with the regard to print out uh, first when the cycle is started the printer first should display all the uh, parameters set parameters like what temperature you have set what pre vacuum value you have set and what post vacuum value you have set and that will be displayed on the top of the printer along with that it displays the date time batch and cycle so these are all inbuilt once you uh, start once the operator starts the thing it ask you to enter the batch number cycle number and parameter settings once it is start the first part of the printout will be the setting parameter and next it displays uh, this time what temperature and pressure is achieved 
and you can regulate the thing uh, certain print out will happen uh, per minute or or you want for 5 minutes you can change the parameter uh, the setting so each and every minute it displays what temperature and, and pressure is achieved and also displays the sequence of time that uh, post pulsing is over sterilization has started sterilization is over drying is happening and cycle completed so uh, it shows all the uh, important parameters starting from uh, the uh, site setting parameters till the end so this what we generally recommend sir does your printout uh, mention whether the cycle has passed or failed yeah it yeah, shows uh, because all our things has got displays the f0 value uh, f0 value is nothing but the lethal death rate value it displays the f0 value and it shows the complete uh, cycle completed but actually only the indicators inside can show that the cycle uh-huh. is passed or not that will be a different thing if the all the physical phases of your cycle temperature pressure everything is done correctly as programmed yes sir. the print out have the word cycle passed because that no. is important yeah because uh, it will uh, because it depends on whatever loads we keep inside it will only display the f0 value because if the f0 value is more than 20 it is obviously shows that the cycle passes i i was asking only about the physical parameters okay not the killing aspects not the bi that is a different okay. issue okay. so physical program was carried out correctly by your machine you, yes sir can you mention it on the printout cycle passed would that will be medical legal important also i think it says cycle completed ah usually it is completed it will only shows cycle completed because the problem is if <laughs> if they uh, if some other different indicators are inside because yeah. this doesn't know what the the program doesn't know what indicators are inside for no, what application the has your yeah. machine, suppose your cycle of 121 is being used has yeah. the 121 pre- temperature been achieved and maintained for that much period of time yes sir because your sensors will be there inside So yes. From this, will your software be able to mention that these conditions are met ah, yes sir so that only i told uh, because once one twenty nine is reached for each and every count for one minute the f not value increases if our f not value is more than twenty obviously the, the the cycle passes but certain helix test uh, addition go by that method if they have put a helix the your voice is breaking think that there is some issue ah uh, some let internet issue probably so uh, um there are lots of questions on eto sterilization and yeah. can we also sterilization sequence will be passed by showing it is completed but the indicator what indicator we have put inside that has to change correlation between that indicator and this printing system okay Right. So, uh, what about uh, ETO sterilization? There are questions whether the paper probes can be ETO sterilized so the life can be longer. Uh, is it a feasible way? And uh, maybe uh, uh, I would request one of the panelists to answer that. Question. As far as uh, uh, the recommendation from the Alcon part is concerned, it's very clearly written: gas sterilization not to be done. The reason is that. the uh, you can have ethylene dioxide formation that is uh, can lead to tas formation so uh, steam sterilization is the safest way to do a sterilization as far as uh, the fico hand piece is concerned others are using plasma but steam sterilization still remains the most commonly used and the safest and easily validatable dr sanjay you, you quick comments i think uh, you are yes, i agree sir uh, there is a basic principle of sterilization just one sentence if you ca- if it can be autoclaved autoclave it correct if it is not possible then think of other methods yeah and one question on autoclaving already sterilized uh, uh, things like uh, the uh, medicine uh, the dyes and other things what do you recommend autoclaving the bss and other uh, pre sterilized thing so that it is autoclaved again for safety purpose the general dictum is if anything that we have purchased as sterile need not be re-sterilized again and there are certain uh, risk factors so here we are depending on the manufacturer's quality we expect that they have taken trials they have studied their production methods ensured quality and given us a sterile product 
and it is physical suppose you buy 10 bottles of iv it is not possible to check every bottle find out whether there's contamination there are a lot of weak points in the culture testing that we do endotoxin testing also may not pick it up second thing why i don't advise doing iv fluid bottle autoclaving again is suppose let's take for example there is some contamination has occurred say gram negative contamination occurred in a bottle during manufacture when i autoclave that bottle i am breaking up the bacteria i am releasing the endotoxin into the iv fluid okay so that endotoxin is more dangerous than a living bacteria going into the eye that endotoxin is not destroyed by autoclaving it will get stuck to the iris or some soft tissue material in the eye if it remains there you will definitely land up with a test which you cannot treat with antibiotics because it's a molecule i would prefer a living bacteria going into the eye than using antibiotics it is a more successful option for me so there's no point in autoclaving uh, iv fluids it may lead to problems actually what i suggest instead of that you should have multiple levels of checking the fluid bottles that you're going to use so first thing is when you get them from the manufacturer in your hospital random checking suppose you get 100 bottles check at least 10 percent of them for any particulate particles or any fungal growth or anything you can see so the store people can do it who is receiving from there once it goes to the ot again there about 10 percent should be checked and next from the OT store, when it goes to the operating table, there every bottle should be checked. Hmm? Culturing the bottles is not so useful because use if it's purchased as sterile, we have to assume it is sterile. Autoclaving that may actually cause a problem if there is a gram negative contamination in that. There are lots of questions from the audience, which uh, hundreds of questions which we are not able to take up. So, <laughs> sir, maybe we would like <laughs> before we finish. Uh, repetition. Yeah, before we finish, uh, maybe we would request a few or uh, two or three questions from the audience and then uh, we can close the session. If any of you please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, from the audience side, you can uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. So, sir, my question is at the end of the cycle, when the uh, moisture is removed in the drying cycle with the vacuum, uh, when that cycle is over, does the uh, room air enter the autoclave and the load? Yes, it does. Then does it uh, lead to uh, contamination of the load? The machine is supposed to have a filter. Right. I think, uh, Shakti sir, you can, can, can I answer the question? question. Sir, actually, uh, there is a HEPA filter which only allows the filtered air. So the all uh, particles will be out. So it only allows the filtered air inside the chamber. So yeah, part of the maintenance of the machine is that many people forget replacing this filter. Uh, Shakti, how often uh, should one uh, uh, validate your machine or AMC of your machine? Like how often should one do? Yes, sir. Is it dependent on cycles that you run or is it dependent on the duration like a yearly? Like how often, like how many uh, cycles can your machine withstand? Sir, actually, generally, there are two types of validation. Uh, one is, as I already told, uh, those uh, pressure monitors and temperature monitors, no, no, pressure sorry. gauges. Uh, what I'm talking yeah. to is with regard to AMC. This is with regard to once you have installed your machine and we are using your machine. Yes, how sir. often should we do your AMC checkup for your filters, rest of the things which requires replacement? Gauges, sir, devices. Uh, at least uh, once in four months, sir. At least four months. Once in four months, we have to check all the uh, pressure lines. We have to check is there any block due to any scaling formation. We have to check whether any uh, there's any uh, 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 corrosion on the chamber or in pipes. So, so it's better to have once in four months. Actually, what we have done uh, with Shakti is that. Uh, because this maintenance, many companies sell the autoclaves. After that, this AMC doesn't happen. Right. So we have worked out a model where the, there is a complete AMC, CMC coverage for three years once the machine is bought. So for three years, uh, Shakti and his team will be maintaining that equipment. 
that uh, maybe the since the question on AMC so yeah. any other question one question yes sir yes, please go ahead sir uh, along with the autoclave uh, would you be also providing the packing and sealing equipment because that is also very important yes sir yeah because there uh, we also pro provide sealing machines it's a heat sealing machine uh, there are two types of uh, machines on the heat sealing machine one is just normal sealer where you can vary the temperature there is other sealing machine it comes with the printout with the date time and batch cycle everything these are rotary sealers yeah yes sir. there are two types of rotary sealers one is the basic sealers with uh, only the uh, digital temperature and timing controller there's mm. other high end sealers where you can actually uh, enter the values yeah, in terms of like a barcode in terms of like a, a date or timing batch number everything sir approximate cost sir those uh, those second types sealers are expensive come something around 2.5 lakhs where you enter the values but basic sealers come something around 30 to 35000 sir depending on the uh, uh, loading area and the capacity so these basic ones are rotary sealers only yes yes sir what is automatic the rotary sealers okay width of the seal sir will be it starts with uh, 3 mm okay till it goes up till 20 to 25 mm depending on the load sir okay. i think 3 to 5 mm should be sufficient for up that yes yes so, uh, any other questions from the audience, uh, please go ahead and yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Sharp. Uh, yeah, sir, uh, basically, I was interested in buying Casby Autoclave uh, because I am using vertical uh, gravity-based one. But the space in my autoclave room is very small. So, I almost gave a check and cancelled my order. So, what alternative and how I can upgrade myself? I am very keen to know that. Shakti, what is the minimum space required for, say, a 40 liter or 75 liter? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, for a 40 liter, uh, the uh, space, what the equipment occupies will be approximately something around uh, 3 feet by uh, 4 to 5 feet, sir. Yeah, because why I say 4 to 5 feet is someone has to stand there, open the doors in order to load if you are buying a horizontal model. 3 by 5 feet will be well enough to go ahead for the horizontal autoclaves. So, one, because the space is a huge constraint, can we have this autoclave in a separate area, sterilize and bring it? Uh, is it uh, uh, possible? What is the suggestion? That's what all uh, big hospitals do when they have a central CSSD. So, only thing is you should have your wrapping uh, thing in place correctly. Uh, with regard to the previous question, the thing is, it depends, Dr. Shraddha, it depends on your practice. How big is your practice? Okay. How many cases you are doing? So, for you, a tabletop autoclave, if you are doing, uh, so suppose you are doing three or four cases per day, a tabletop autoclave uh, can actually be kept in your uh, OT itself. And that can, if you have the space for it to be kept. And you can still do a complete full cycle and use the use it if you want. So a tabletop class B autoclave would serve the purpose. Because uh, basically the other concern we have is that we think if the autoclave is inside the OT, we feel more confident about the process. <laughs> so we are not uh, able to uh, really think that, oh, I can keep this autoclave in a separate area. That is another reason, though hospitals have spaces which are unutilized, but everybody wants to keep the autoclave inside the OT. OT area. So the uh, that is another reason for the space. Uh, yes, yeah, but my Maybe actually my opinion is if, if it's a bench top uh, or or compact model, it is well and good to keep it inside the OT. If it's a horizontal model, it is not advisable to keep inside yeah, the OT. That, that will not be possible. That's that, is big, that, big, that, that, big, that, that is big to be yeah. kept. No, so not in the, the OT. OT area itself. People want to have it uh, near the OT or just no, basically next. that will reduce the risk of contamination. See, basically, if you have it in a separate area, somebody has to go pick it from there and get it. Yeah. So the whole uh, path is a risk for contamination. How they are getting it, right. how they are doing it. So you have specialized uh, boxes also 
uh, wherein uh, which are big uh, hospitals which are using endoscopes use actually it comes in a sealed box and that sealed box can be carried like a suitcase and yeah. that they carry it from place to place and whatever is inside that uh, box is autoclaved is sterile until this box is opened so those are used by uh, various endoscopic surgeons so what and small hospitals can do is split the autoclave into leather and instrument separate machines leather right. you can go for a gravity one which is already there in a small room for instruments use a class b kept in the ot right so i i, I wanted to bring out one point over here that the take home message uh, uh, being uh, should be that not not just about the right autoclave but how much time and energy we as ophthalmologists give in actually looking at the processes in, in our tssu there should be written down standard operating procedures which our ot staff have written and they should be proud of the processes what they are doing then and then will they be able to follow them moreover they should be empowered to check uh, to see stop uh, any load if there is any sterilization failure and they should be trained repeatedly about the uh, the how to identify sterilization failure which is really lacking moreover still law many 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 of us are still using type 1 chemical indicator that is only the exposure control it does not give and tell you anything about the validity of sterilization so if you really want to validate your sterilization you have to at least have a class 5 indicator and of course the biological indicator once in a month but uh, the pa uh, the load if you want to validate its sterility you have to have a class 5 still many of us are using only class 1 so the best thing is to go tomorrow and see in your own tssus what are the indicators using how is the cleaning happening and definitely no enzymatic cleaners or disinfectant should never be used to clean any instruments complete no non enzymatic or if you don't want to use any uh, and cleaners just use plain water distilled water or ro water the final rinse of the instrument should be with ro water or with distilled water and distilled water i have seen in hospitals they bring those big cans and they are kept and used forever that gets contaminated that is even worst if you want to use distilled water to clean your instruments you should be having a distilled water making plant in your own ot otherwise ro is more safe so these are the simple important things and dr sanjay was telling me about how to check the quality of water before this webinar started i think dr sanjay before this webinar ends you yeah. should talk about how to check the quality of water because it's so important yeah thank, thank you for the opportunity dr yeah, thank you uh, water quality is one of the most important parameters in the ot not only for cleaning even for cssd also so basic requirement is minimum treated drinking quality water for the surgical scrub and the cssd minimum or many hospitals can go for ro water ro water i mean dialysis quality water now the ph and tds depends on what type of water you are using mm. so if you have a dialysis query ro water then the ph should be ideally below 7 and the tds should be ideally zero but it can go up to 10 to 15 with the quality of source water also sometimes so anything above 15 20 should alert you to a possibility of a problem okay for drinking water quality if you are using treated corporation water municipal water i would suggest monitoring tds and making sure it is below 200 that's for the drinking water okay so this is the physical part okay microbiological part i find most of the hospitals they first of all they do not test the ot scrub water and the cssd water so that testing should be done at least once a month you can rotate what but you can send the ot scrub what but you can send the cssd water source if the supply is the same okay so in that once a year do the physical testing all the hardness tds ph calcium magnesium everything minimum once a year and whenever the source changes or you get a, dip, a bad quality of water supply like for example in sub cases in uh, sub areas in mumbai or even in kolhapur when there is a rainy season we get muddy water okay in the corporation supply so that type itself you should check the physical quality if it is not up to the mark don't use that for cleaning is to bed something will remain back in your is to beds and it will go into the patient's eyes so physical monitoring is important microbiological monitoring the commonly done test most people do is the coliform test or e coli test okay now that test 
it looks only for the coliforms. It's a basically a test for detecting contamination of drinking water by sewage. That is what it is used for. Whereas in an OT or a CHSD, I would also like to know whether my water has something like acidotobacter. It does it have an MRSA or a staph aureus in the water? Is there a pseudomonas in the water or a proteus? Because all these are water loving bacteria. Okay. So I need to do what is called as a total plate count test. PPC. Okay. So this should be done by an endodontal metal testing laboratory somewhere near you. It is not done in a routine clinical micro laboratory. Only routine, we are geared for testing patient samples, not endodontal samples apart from maybe OT swaps. Okay. So get it done in a proper laboratory. And the counts. For treated water, usually there are no upper limits, but we have to fix a baseline depending on the water source in your area. If you are using dialysis grade water, then the count in the total uh, plate count should be below 200 CFU per ml. Anything above 100 should alert to a possibility of a contamination. So this water quality monitoring is very, very important and it should be documented. Uh, maybe somebody is. Uh, can Dr. Raju, can you mute uh, the, uh, that was sorry. fantastic information, huh, by the way? Yeah, yeah. thank you. So actually, there was a lot of uh, interesting uh, <coughs> uh, concepts, traditional concepts we, uh, were broken today. Uh, that is what I could say. Uh, maybe as a layman or somebody who is not a specialist in autoclaves, if I can summarize uh, what we learned today. so. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe uh, the panelists can correct me if it's uh, wrong. So one thing is class B autoclaves are recommended for ophthalmology and not the flash kind of uh, the tabletop flash uh, as a smaller autoclaves. And uh, second thing is always uh, uh, go for uh, the documentation has to be proper uh, in terms of uh, getting an autoclave. So I remember one question about uh, there is a repeated question coming on the power consumption. Uh, Shakti, can you, uh, is it uh, mandatory to have a three-phase uh, connection to have these autoclaves, uh, the regular horizontal ones? And what is the power uh, consumption? With regard to the horizontal model is concerned, uh, since the working volume is more, uh, obviously the steam generator should be of higher capacity. So in order to generate steam at higher rate, uh, three-phase is mandatory and Secondary, the vacuum pumps used in bench jobs are all compact ones, but on the horizontal models are uh, all industrial models for commercial use. So that requires a three phase. So once our vacuum pump capacity is high, obviously our uh, air removal will happen at a faster rate. And for horizontal model, we recommend to have a three phase unit. So, uh, Maybe we can have a last uh, round of comments uh, from the panelists. Uh, we can start with uh, Dr. Raju and then go on to Dr. Samina and uh, Partho Bakshi, Dr. Partho Bakshi and uh, Dr. Sanjay, and then we can close the session. Yeah. So what I want to say is there are uh, various things in uh, sterilization. You have to go into the depth of it to understand it. Otherwise, the superficial knowledge that uh, we are all discussing uh, uh, in our uh, WhatsApp or anything may actually mislead you. So you have to go into depth of each and everything to know what you are exactly we are doing. That's the first thing I would say. Even I started as a layman when I started my own setup. Because we all learn how to do a FACO because before we can learn how to clean the FACO handpiece. That's why many of us would not know how to clean a FACO handpiece. So best is to go back and read everything and follow the manufacturer guidelines closely. Ask them to give it in writing. Like how I should autoclave your handpiece. You get it in writing from them. Then you see that many of them will not actually come back and tell you how you should do. So we'll have to uh, set our processes in place for our setup. And just because what I told you, the water is validated for somebody else, doesn't mean it gets validated in your autoclave. The same autoclave may be supplied by the same manufacturer, may pass the test, uh, the process challenge device test 
at 15 minutes in one one setup it may not pass the same test at 15 minutes in your setup so what passes in your setup you have to validate and keep it and that you should use it that is the standard for your autoclave so that is what i would uh, tell you each one has to customize it for your autoclave and for your setup and for your load actually how many how much load you are putting into the equipment also matters so if you are using different loads then you are you have to validate the load so all those things you have to keep it in mind when you are doing and as said use the correct uh, integrators and the process challenge devices especially if you are using reusable uh, tubings thank you sir dr parto uh, your comments and then we will go on to dr so um, like uh, dr said ahead that uh, we need to be uh, um, learning all the time Uh, it, it's been a problem with all of us that we no, never ever learned sterilization processes in our uh, uh, post graduation days, nor even in uh, our fellowship days. And when we land into, uh, and not even in corporate hospitals where we get a chance to do surgeries, and when we land into private practice, that is the time we start learning. But uh, we need to remember that we need to adopt the best practices or scenario and keep improving all the time. like right. dr samina said class 5 indicators is a must even if you have a, a vertical autoclave make do with that but have the best practices and have a proper documentation so these are very few simple things one um, <coughs> final thing i wouldn't would like to add is uh, there's a book um, by the aws on infection control these are basic minimum requirements uh, regarding ot procedures and um, uh the sops those are the minimal guidelines that are to be followed lot of questions uh, that were on the chat can be easily answered by this four page booklet by the ais okay may not be all the uh, questions on sterilization but please everyone should uh, go through it and thank you dr senthil for the opportunity yeah thank you dr uh, dr samina madam mayu Hi, yeah, I'm here, Dr. Sandil. I just wanted to again uh, uh, highlight three things. First is that please take time out and see that standard operating procedures are in place. There is a 40 minutes webinar what I have taken on how to write SOP for a healthcare worker. It might be a good idea to go through it and empower your uh, OT staff. They are the real warriors of your uh, uh, hosp hospital, and they should be trained. And keep and a lot of external trainings happen all the time for HIC. Please send them for. that that is one thing secondly there is no harm in putting a cctv in the area where the cleaning and the drying and the soaking happens it's a good idea please put a cctv so that that's all, at any point of time you want to check on that you can check check and see if there is it's done correctly or not and thirdly whenever your uh, autoclave or any machines uh, service agent comes to your doorstep you know they scribble something and give you as a service note please do not accept it ask for an stp report that's a standard test protocol report which has every parameter checked calibration checked and then file it in your that particular machines file and uh, that's how, uh, and even see that your uh, manufacturer will take cognizance of that so an stp report for all your machines when they come for servicing thank you so much dr sendil you're doing a great job thanks a lot uh, dr sanjay uh, your last uh, comment thank you uh, first of all i would like to thank all of you for a very nice session very good discussion and as everybody must have realized this is a very deep topic and they will take a lot of webinars to cover every aspect of it so just talking broadly what i would say is uh, first of all everyone should get the terminology right like there is a lot of confusion about what is a flash some people think it's a machine some people know it's a cycle so because of this terminology misunderstanding there is a lot of confusion in the understand concepts so first get the terminology right second thing is hic guidelines are basically broad guidelines they are not specific guidelines you take any guideline cdc who any guideline you take so what has to be done is to we have to customize the guideline to your individual setup and since india is a set up huge country with a lot of diversity we cannot have one specific guideline which can fit every hospital there will be variation so we need to define 
what can be the limits of the variation. For example, we need to give options. Suppose I don't have space. Do I use two autoclaves, one for the instruments, one for the linen? If I have space, I can use one autoclave, then what should I go for? So we, each one of you needs to know the science and then customize it to your setup so that each of these things is particularly followed. Okay, So this is a basic thing. Second thing, another area where I'm always interested in is uh, costing of infection control. Now, how many of you actually know what is the cost of auto cleaning, autoclaving, one set in your setup. How many of you calculated it? I don't think so. Because nobody thinks about it. These are all hidden costs. Okay. And when you're setting up an OT or buying a machine, we look at the initial costs of the machine. It is too costly or something. Don't look at the initial cost. Look at the running cost that you're going to spend on it. So when you're buying an autoclave, what I would suggest is look at your case load. Look at the number of sets you need to autoclave every day. Try to achieve maximum autoclaving in minimum cycles. That should be the size of your machine. Okay, If it is costly, even then go for it. But it will reduce your running cost. It will make your sterile metal available whenever you need it. Okay, So these are complete new aspect, HIC costing. So I would suggest everyone to go back to the OT. Find out the cost of all the infection prevention measures you're doing. OT cleaning, fumigation, sterilization, cleaning. And you will see it finds out adds up to a significant amount on a yearly basis. And that's why we need to go for the correct things with minimum cost, maximum effect. And this is important because here the returns are in terms of quality, not in terms of money. So when I invest in a good autoclave, I'm investing, I'm getting returns in terms of good sterilization. I don't get money back. Okay. So we need to think a bit differently when you think about HIC returns. Okay. So minimum cost, maximum quality output. That should be the approach for HIC. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sanjay. Very well summarized as usual. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, we just planned it uh, three, four days back. And Dr. Raju was very helpful uh, for organizing this meeting. And Thanks, Shakti, for uh, the wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjay Kumpani. You just uh, intimated you uh, two days back. And, uh, oh, sir. Glad it very well, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank well, you. And, uh, please thanks, get no type. Thanks, Dr. Partho and Dr. Samina. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Nirmal and Dr. MSR, sir, who has also left. And uh, so we didn't do too much of promotion, but almost we had 100 people who were there for two hours today. Oh, great. Thank you, everybody. And uh, hope uh, we will. I'm planning to have these sessions once a month, like this virtual discussion. Maybe next month we might have on a different topic, uh, which is not uh, generally covered. And uh, thank you, everybody. And please do uh, pass on your uh, views and uh, feedbacks about this event. And uh, looking forward to your support to the Octal initiatives. And uh, if you require this autoclave, uh, please do get in touch. And, uh, uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good night. And uh, see you uh, next next. Uh, thank, you. Next, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay sir and Raju sir. I've learned uh, something new from uh, both. It was nice having you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to work with you uh, and yeah. give it our perspective and input so that. Uh, we want to promote the Make in India <laughs> initiative <laughs> and uh, uh, make the uh, Class B autoclaves available at a uh, very reasonable order. Yes, yes, sir. Or, yes. Uh, and that should uh, withstand the test of time. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I personally visited their factory many times, and his father is in the business of autoclaves for the last 30 years. So okay. he's dedicated his life for autoclave making. And uh, so uh, Shakti is now taking it up and we also wanted to support him. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a good Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.